Please be seated. Wednesday's text study, so that you know, is a lot of fun. And it's not just a lot of fun, there's a lot of insights shared. You think pastors know everything? We would like to believe it, but we don't. And the insights from that group are so powerful and interesting, and I'm still thinking about them today. Yeah, you can come. Nobody is an expert even there. So don't worry that, oh, I don't know enough about the Bible. Here's the th One of the things we talked about is that we need each other. We need each other to share insights and to sort of rub off on each other so that if we're really too weird, someone will say that in love. <laughs> like, no, that's, that's an odd thought, Jerry, and, uh, but I love you. But here's another way of thinking about that, see? Um, and some of those insights, by the way, both Pastor Kim and I bring to the sermon, as I'm going to do today, because they were powerful. And uh, two questions that I'm going to feature, and I want to say them now so you can think about them during the homily. One of them is, number one, can love really be commanded? Can you command someone to love? Jesus does. Right? Four times in today's lessons, he commands us. Number two, why does John, John the epistle writer, say that our faith, your faith and mine, conquers the world? Isn't that kind of an imperialistic phrase, conquers? Haven't we seen enough conquering by people who are tyrants? Why does John, this gentle the epistle writer who talks about God's love used the word conquer and used the word world in that same way. Why does John, who knows about Jesus' gentle love, say, and just remember, your faith conquers the world? Okay, I'm not going to answer it right now. I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> because this story is what the gospel text is about. Many of you have gone to your, you know, high school reunions over the years. I hear people all the time saying that, you know what, I missed them all. <laughs> uh, my 10 year, I was gone out of the country. My 20 year, I was somewhere else, I couldn't make it. The 30 year one, I thought I'd go and something came up, had to be somewhere. My 40th year, I didn't go. And at year 48, in a gesture of extreme grace, over the top love, my high school, Roseville High School, nominated me to be in their Hall of Fame. <laughs> I mean, it was over the top, you know, all this kind of stuff. But I thought, you know, I haven't made any of the reunions. I'd like to walk into those halls. Because high school is quite a formative time, is it not, for all of us? Where our dreams, our values, uh, experiences that last a lifetime remain with us. And I wanted to see Mr. Nisla's room, my favorite teacher, and I walked by there and saw that room, and a little tear came to my eye. I miss him. I reunited with him after I was elected bishop. He was in my synod, and we've had a marvelous time together. Well, then I walked by uh, Mr. Lundquist's class. He was another great teacher, and Mrs. Pruitt's class. She might have been one of my all-time favorites of all time. And Mrs. Dolan's class. And as I walked by, I didn't realize how much this was going to mean to me, see. When I was a junior and senior in high school, I was involved in a bunch of plays, and we took, uh, we did, we took on musicals, and I sang, and I loved it, and we took on one-act plays to state, and we won several times. And in particular, the most uh, poignant of all of them was when we did the play Faust, Goethe's marvelous a composition which is filled with depth and I got to play Dr. Faustus and even at age 17 it was powerful for me but not nearly as powerful as it is now that I'm 68 because it is a play about the changes in our lives our perspectives when you're a young man and you got to tackle everything and yes conquer everything, right? You're, you're carving out uh, a space for yourself that's different from everybody else. And for most males, it's conquering, <laughs> sadly. Um, but it's, it's a natural thing, see? 
All right. Faust is a play about a man who in his early middle age made a pact with the devil. Some of you know this. And the pact was this. He wasn't feeling fulfilled in life. Uh, he was a very intelligent person and he had means, but it wasn't enough. He still felt something missing, hugely missing. So he makes this pact with the devil and in that pact, the devil gives him everything he wants. That's what the devil does in the stories in the Bible. And he gets women, all the women he wants, all the power he wants, all the money he wants, all the status he wants, and it still ain't enough. He's still unfulfilled. He's not happy. And by the end of the play, Faust is an old man. His perspectives have been changed by the winds of time and experience. He no longer believes that all these packs with the devil are bringing him joy. He's without joy. And something happens to him uh, in his old age. Instead of winning fights and amassing material goods and using power over others and conquering women and gaining privileged status, he has matured. And he works at building dikes on the ocean front so that people can move back there and have a livelihood and raise their families. And he's discovered the power of love. And finally, he is filled with joy at the end of the play. It's a powerful piece. And uh, I've discovered the same kind of thing in my life. It's not exactly parable. I've never had as much money as him. Or, or Yes, or women, thankfully. <laughs> yes. But you know what? Jesus talks about this very thing. Now I'm going to read this because the texts are very powerful. All right. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. As you keep the commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept the commandments. And I say these things to you so that what? My joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. Following Jesus' commandments brings joy. And it goes on. I do not call you servants any longer because I've told you everything I'm doing. You're my friends. I want you to have the joy that the Father and I have. And remember, you didn't choose me. I chose you, and I'll stick by you. Is basically what he's saying. And then in John, the epistle for the second lesson, the love of God is this that we obey his what? Commandments. And his commandments, all of them are about love. You might remember Jesus summarized the entire Bible when they asked him what was the most important commandment. And I kind of forgot what was that most important commandment. Was it love? <laughs> yes, unequivocally. He said all of the Bible, this is my paraphrase, can be summarized this way. Love God and love your neighbor, and joy will find you. Uh, the American Declaration of Independence, <laughs> wonderful document, but it guarantees the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> okay, good on the writers. But the problem is, because it's a political document and not a spiritual one, it doesn't warn you of the frustrations of pursuing happiness because you don't find happiness by pursuing it. You don't find joy by pursuing it. You've all heard this marvelous little butterfly illustration. I'll tell it to you again. If you want to catch a butterfly, put away the net because it's the wrong goal to use a net to try to catch the butterfly. But if you change direction look away from the butterfly, busy yourself with other activities, the butterfly might just find itself over on your shoulder after a little while. And that's how joy works. You don't get joy by some sort of transactional thing. By pursuing it, it comes and finds you as you love 
your neighbor. All of them. And I will add this. I think, for my money, the more of your neighbors that you love, the more joy you have, including your enemies. That's a hard one, isn't it? But Jesus is unequivocal. You love the whole world because, as he says twice in here, that's what my father does. And you're joined to your father through me. So you get to love the whole world, including your enemies. Well, how does that work? You know, here's the problem. We do love people. On occasion, we love our enemies. It might be a little bit of work, but it happens. And I can't tell you the dozens and dozens of people who have shared with me as their pastor, you know, pastor, that love thing really works. And uh, I am glad that they tell me that. It's a reminder to me that when I'm not feeling joyful, Maybe I've been pursuing joy in the wrong way and not following Jesus' commands. Now, here are the two objections we had in text study. You can't command someone to love, someone from on high, some tyrant saying, you will love someone or else. And that's right. But that's not what's happening here. For those of you who love words, the word command has got two parts. The Latin derivation is commandatum. Mandatum means mandate, command. But what about that word co? It means with. Oh, like sliding with your daughter, with your daughter in a scary situation. She did it because daddy went with her. Jesus is saying, by using the word command, co, mandatum, uh, not only do I give you the command, but I will be what? With you in it. You're not alone. The power to love even, yes, your enemies is given by Christ himself. Uh, He's not going to leave us orphans, as he promised. He will be with us in that great section of Matthew 28 till the end of all time. We may break our promises. God doesn't. Jesus doesn't. The Holy Spirit doesn't, see? Um, Abide in that love then, you see. Now, here's the thing about following Jesus. We get to muck it up once in a while. (laughs) Not that we're looking for that. But we do muck it up from time to time. And Jesus says, that's all right. I claimed you. You didn't even choose me to begin with, so don't worry about it. I chose you, and I will be with you even if you muck it up. That's why we, every Sunday, in some form or another, Uh, Either thank God for the gift of baptism, which reminds us of forgiveness, or we confess our sins, not to get God to forgive us, God's already done that, but so that we remember how joyful it is to be forgiven. And it gives us the strength to go out again. Uh, I had little lambs the last two Wednesdays, you know, our preschool here. Marvelous kids, like all the kids here. And uh, I told them about these texts, see, and that uh, God is with us, and that we were born to love, because we're made in the image of God. So I taught him a little song, and I'm going to teach you this song, because you sing beautifully, and you obeyed the rubrics for your voices this morning. (laughs) Okay, sing it after me. We'll do it antiphonally. Up above my head, head, I I hear laughter in the air. Up above my head, I hear laughter in the air, air. and I really do believe believe that we're born to care. care. Up above my head, head. I hear crying in the air. air. Up above my head, head. I hear crying in the air. air. And I really do believe believe that we're born to care. care. Up above my head, head. I hear joy in the air. air. Up above my head, head. I hear joy in the air. air. And I really do believe believe we were made to care. Yesterday is gone. 
tomorrow has not yet come, live into the joy of being chosen and appointed by Christ.